just when I thought I was out, they pull me back in. Just in case you are new to this channel, I am a huge fan of Remedy Entertainment. I recently completed a four-part retrospective on everything Alan Wake, and not too long ago, I covered Quantum Break as well. And pretty much everything that the studio has to offer, I'd label just about all of it as must-play, with Alan Wake 2 and Control in particular easily being two of the best games that I've ever played. Even when it comes to the little pet project that I have going on for this channel, a series of ranking videos that I call Ranking Every Video Game Ever Made, where I take every game that I've covered on this channel and slot them into an ever-growing list and something of an attempt to figure out what the best game I've ever played actually is. Even there, Remedy is currently dominating those rankings with four of their titles currently taking up four of the top 10 positions on that list, with Control currently in the number one spot and Alan Wake 2 just barely, barely coming in second. So even at the release of Alan Wake 2, before making any real dent into that game's campaign, with Remedy offering up a season pass for two DLC chapters in the not so distant future, even if it was at the cost of an extra 20 bones, I I'm sure you know how that went for me. Shut up and take my money! And why wouldn't I pick it up? Control's expansion content was rock solid, and even though it's a bit more than just an expansion, opting for a standalone release and acting as more of an Alan Wake 1.5, 2012's American Nightmare turned out quite alright in the grand scheme of things. So the track record on Remedy's downloadable content up until now, it's been pretty good. So yeah, of course, picked it up. More Alan Wake 2. Let's fucking go. And as a quick aside, I'm going to assume that anyone watching this video has at least some cursory knowledge on the larger Alan Wake universe. So from here on out, I'm just gonna talk about everything kind of freely without going too far in the weeds to explain every little detail. Like everyone else, all I knew for months was that there were going to be two new bits of story content, with the first one being called Night Springs and the eventual second installment called The Lake House. There wasn't much more to go off of other than the names for these chapters, and although I would speculate from time to time about what these chapters would actually be, all I could really do was wait and see when it came to the new content. But then Summer Games Fest happened just a couple weeks ago, and Sam Lake was brought up on stage to give us our first real look at the Night Springs DLC. And in a really cool move, this expansion was launching the very next day following the announcement. And I have to admit, I was hyped. How could I not be? The trailer looked raucous and over the top, and this DLC appeared to feature Sean Ashmore in a more Jack Joyce type of role this time around. And would you look at that? Jessie fucking Faden in her first new chapter since 2020's AWE expansion. So whatever this was gonna be, it was gonna be awesome, right? Well. In a cruel turn of events, somehow, now that I'm on the other side of playing this new installment, through some sort of bizarre fuckery, I've somehow come to the conclusion that this new expansion of what I can only say is one of my favorite pieces of media altogether, an expansion that leans into Remedy's connected universe and catalog arguably as hard as they ever have, somehow this entry is what I would consider to be a real low point in terms of quality when it comes to the output from my favorite finished developer. But keep in mind, I'm not trying to be hyperbolic here, and even the worst content coming from Remedy is not without some of its charm. There is some fun to be had here for sure, and there are some really cool moments, but yeah, overall I walked away from this feeling largely negative. I know. I was shocked too. Let me explain, and keep in mind that there will be spoilers for this DLC from here on out. For the uninitiated, Night Springs is an anthology piece. Using the trappings of the in-universe TV show of Night Springs, the Twilight Zone analog that first showed up in the original Alan Wake, this expansion gives the player three short campaigns starring the familiar faces of Rose Marigold, Jesse Faden, and Tim Breaker from the Alan Wake series. Well, sort of, not really, but more on that in a bit and each of these episodes are written in-universe by Alan Wake himself, with this being more or less the same framing device that we saw back in American Nightmare. And just like in American Nightmare, these episodes here are also attempts for Alan to once again write himself out of the dark place. And just right there, just in the premise, I found myself a little at odds with what this expansion was doing. I've completed both Alan Wake 2 and its final draft New Game Plus mode of sorts, and I've seen all the content, and without spoiling everything too much, the place Alan was left in, especially after the final draft ending. And so I return. With me I bear the torch of knowledge, the light, the miracle illuminated, the master of two worlds. No, the master of many worlds. At least for me, coming back to this framing device felt like retreading the same worn ground. 
and at its worst, it felt like this expansion was taking concepts that could be inferred through playing the last 14 years of Remedy games, and now was just beating us over the head with them. I mean, you get it, right? The Remedy Connected Universe, it's a multiverse. But here instead of feeling like the clever set of nods and easter eggs that loosely connect all of these games, here in Night Springs, things take on the tone of a bad Rick and Morty episode. What is my purpose? You pass butter. Oh my god. First things first, I played the three episodes in this experience in the order that they were presented. You can tackle all of these in whichever way you'd like, but I just opted to play them from top to bottom. I guess I'm kind of a basic bitch like that sometimes. But it ultimately might have been the best way to go about exploring this content. I started with the episode called Number One Fan, starring a woman who looks suspiciously like Rose Marigold, the waitress of the Oh Dear Diner in Alan Wake proper, but here she is simply known as The Waitress. This chapter, in particular, is the most lighthearted of the bunch. We meet up with the waitress as she is daydreaming about her lover, the writer, before she sets out on her shift at Night's Diner. She does all the things that you would have expected Rose to do in the main game. She serves coffee, pie, and doles out advice to all of her patrons, but here, Everything is a bit too idyllic. The coffee she serves, it is described as a delicious brew that only she knows how to make. The pie is award winning. And a fan site that the waitress runs about the writer is described this way. Hot coffee. I heard your fan site for that writer was named best fan site in the world. Congratulations. Oh, thanks. It wasn't easy. This character, she is not just a waitress, she is the best waitress. But when a patron asks her for a book recommendation, things become even more surreal. The waitress goes to the back office to get a copy of the writer's newest novel to lend out, and then this happens. Anthony, your favorite writer whose voice you would recognize in your sleep. I'm in danger. Please, my number one fan, you're the only one who can save me. I'm on my way. And this kicks things off for this chapter, while also acting as a cheeky nod to a particularly fun altered item detailed in Control. The writer has hijacked this novelty singing fish, somehow, and then it's off to the races. But first, the waitress has to arm herself to the teeth. But as the waitress gears up to fight for her beloved, rather than any of the customers being alarmed by any of this, everyone celebrates her to a disquieting level. And this scene kind of invokes the Deerfest section of Alan Wake 2 proper, but it also kind of reminded me of another fucked up moment in media. And it's here that I'm going to make something clear. We know Rose. The Rose from Alan Wake proper. And she is a bit, well, flighty. She is a super fan, she is an obsessive, even claiming to have been in contact with the writer while he had been missing in the dark place for the 13 years between the numbered entries. But in this story, this episode of Night Springs, number one fan, this is written by Alan Wake. In the main game, Rose is seen as an eccentric like Cynthia Weaver before her, but this episode here, what was inferred is treated with all the subtlety of a sledgehammer. In the main game, there was always an air of skepticism when it came to Rose, with the player always being uncertain as to whether her supposed messages from the author were genuine or nothing more than delusion. Or was she telling the truth the whole entire time, and was Alan just using this poor girl as a tool all along? But here in Night Springs, this metafiction basically shows us that, yes, Alan has been using her. He's been using her the whole time, full stop. Between the plastic fish showing up in reflections, speaking to the waitress through a talking deer, but I knew your heart would never waver. You're the only one who can save me. These are the methods that Alan uses to communicate with her in Night Springs. And these methods are not too dissimilar from what Rose had outlined in Alan Wake 2. Just in that game, it was always treated like she might be crazy. But here with it being shown that Alan's using these methods, it, it kind of gives a lot of credibility to her. But with all that said, back to the game part of this number one fan campaign. While on the trail of the writer, the waitress stumbles upon the writer's evil twin brother, in what can only be explained as a soap opera retelling of the Mr. Scratch character. And from here on out, this game becomes an action affair. As the evil twin sets loose an army of haters, this game's terminology, not mine, onto the waitress. And for the rest of this campaign, this is a big dick action game as filtered through Alan Wake 2's combat engine, complete with poorly mixed rockabilly music, <laughs> 
cheesy and repetitive one-liners. And oddly enough for an Alan Wake 2 expansion, nearly infinite bullets. If the storytelling here stripped away all of the nuance and subtlety found in the main game, the action gameplay here in The Waitress does the same thing to the combat. Your rifle and shotgun are both the end game versions of each weapon from the jump, meaning that they are extremely lethal, and in the case of the shotgun, you can just kind of hold down the trigger for extremely quick kills. There's no need to burn away any darkness from enemies here. In fact, these enemies just act as unshielded versions of the Taken altogether, all while doing nothing to really differentiate themselves from the main game, other than spew a few thematically relevant one-liners. Health packs are plentiful, and all the attention that we've come to expect from the main game has been surgically excised in this experience. And realistically, it is kind of a problem, because this engine and the way that characters handle within it, the claustrophobic over-the-shoulder camera and the plotting movement, these things served Alan Wake 2 proper because all of this was built from the ground up for a survival horror experience. But here in the action alternative, it just kind of feels heavy and unresponsive. I know people like the Resident Evil Mercenaries modes just fine, and this is kinda similar to something like that in theory, but this is lacking the close quarters combat stuff from that mode, and without the flashlight gimmick that has come to define Alan Wake so far, this just feels more like a generic run and gun mode than anything that Remedy has done to date. That is unless of course we are still counting their contracted work on the delisted campaign modes for Crossfire X, but I feel like we were kind of supposed to forget that that had ever happened. If we look at Remedy's output starting with Max Payne, their pedigree has always been built upon solid action gameplay, plus an overpowered gimmick tailored exactly to whatever experience they are trying to build. And since the original Alan Wake, the modern Remedy design has always been solid gameplay, plus environmental storytelling and finding documents to aid to that end, and then finding ways to blend different mediums into the experience. Here, all of those core tenets are stripped down. Sure, you will still find a document or two if you're looking in this chapter, but exploration is gutted as you follow an extremely linear path. And sure, David Harwood is present to introduce the chapter, and he is rad as always. And then there's even a cool new Night Springs theme song that acts as an end bumper for each of these episodes. But things are definitely few and far between here. And then the environments here with pretty much everything present other than a few random assets, they're all borrowed and retooled from the main game. And it just kind of makes it so that there's nothing here that is all too exciting to look at, and everything feels a little been there done that. But maybe worse than even that, because the stuff that I did in these environments last time was much better the first time around. But I will give some credit to the rose-colored skybox and lighting found here. It does give this chapter a vibe of its own, as it really does make this vignette feel more surreal and dreamlike. It isn't all doom and gloom though. There is some legitimately funny writing thrown in the mix from time to time, and even though the haters are boring in concept as an enemy type, some of their quips are hilarious. And then pretty much everything about Matthew Peretta's portrayal of the writer's evil twin, it just rules. His lines are funny, self-aware, and the back and forth between him and the waitress, really, this might be the saving grace of this particular chapter. They're ready to die if it stops him from writing another crappy book. What do you got? I have a shotgun. Well, I got a... Wait, is that... That's a real shotgun? Okay, I admit that's a... I didn't expect that. <clears throat> but it doesn't matter. You can't stop all of us. That, and then there's a pretty entertaining little boss fight at the end of this experience. But even that is a remix of a few pre-existing assets from the main game. But at least the whole time this fight is going on, there is the new banter. And then this chapter wraps up in a fun way that is true to the characterization of the delusional waitress that Alan has penned, but it is a lean experience. I took my time with it, looking for everything I could possibly find, just in case there was anything hidden in the environments that might have further lore implications, and even while playing at this slow pace, I still squeezed just about an hour from this chapter. And to be fair, the same can be said for all three chapters that are in this Night Springs DLC. But I'm, I'm really not going to complain about the length of this episode because, well, it kind of does what it does, and I don't think padding it out with more shootouts set to off-brand Cabela's Big Game Hunter music was really going to help this experience. But if I'm being honest, I kind of expected the Waitress chapter to be the odd one out in this package. I mean, with this being a crossover event of sorts, of course a Rose chapter was always going to be a little out there. 
but a control crossover. Come on, man. That's the one I was looking forward to the most. And I know that my imagination probably got the better of me. When the trailer showed what appeared to be Jesse Faden and Tim Breaker fully intruding into the world of Alan Wake 2, my mind went a bit wild. I know nothing like this was shown in the trailer, but I immediately started wondering how abilities like Launch and Time Rush would factor into what had already been established in Alan Wake 2. And with Control 2 already reportedly in the works, I started wondering how Remedy was going to use this experience to start introducing us to concepts that we might expect to see in Jesse's next outing. Like I said, I have only myself and my hyperactive imagination to blame for these thoughts. Instead, this is another case where Remedy more or less asset dumped while retreading most of what we've already seen in previous games, all while doing very little to actually bring Control into Alan Wake 2. Again, this is not actually Jesse Faden we are playing as, even if this character looks and sounds just like her. In this chapter, we are playing as simply the sibling, as she has been trying to track down her brother. And this chapter starts us off at the gates of the Coffee World amusement park found in Alan Wake 2. The area has been remixed and retooled a little, with this particular chapter being the most surreal in this package, but from a campaign perspective, it is also the most uninspired, with it boiling down to the sibling meeting a sheriff, played by Sean Ashmore, and finding out that people have gone missing in this amusement park, and all the relevant evidence seems to point to them hiding out or being imprisoned in a nearby warehouse of sorts. And to make matters worse, there seems to be something in the coffee that might be responsible. There are shadow people to fight here as a result, and they are functionally the same as the ones that we fought during Alan's campaign in the sequel, but the focus of this experience is always clear. Your goal is to gain entry into the nearby warehouse, but of course there are a few puzzles you have to solve before you can actually do that. And in this regard, this chapter, at least on the surface, plays mostly like what we would have come to expect from Alan Wake 2. The flashlight does make its return here, but just like the waitress chapter, the sibling is always given more ammo and batteries than she could ever need. Plus, the fully upgraded pistol from Alan Wake 2, which essentially turns her handgun into a, a fucking Mac 10. So you plot along as a walking turret, the game lays on a strange atmosphere and keeps the lighting to a minimum, so this game kinda leans back into the survival horror trappings, but the strange goings on are decidedly much more in the new weird realm, which is sort of appropriate considering how out there control could be at times, but because of the mechanics, like the number one fan chapter before this one, again, all the tension is just gone. And so we are left with something that feels decidedly more like Grey Hill Incident in terms of its execution than anything from Alan Wake 2. And to add insult to injury, the sibling, she has nothing that even attempts to resemble Jesse's abilities found in Control. And as far as exploration goes, there really isn't much here to flesh out the experience. Remedy did retool the cold stashes from the main game as collectibles for this chapter, but again, everything that made them cool in the main game is gone. In Alan Wake 2, these were sometimes straightforward ammo caches, sometimes they served as permanent upgrades for Saga, but they always had something of a puzzle when it came to unlocking them. The easiest were like that game Simon from back in the day, memorize a short pattern of flashing LED lights, and then play it back. But the most devious ones required breaking out the scratch paper to solve some multi-step algebra problems. But here in Nice Springs, all we have are the Simon puzzles, and they are arguably easier than anything found in the main game. And the reward for opening these cases, more ammo and flashlight batteries, which you are already going to be swimming in in this experience. Again, like the waitress chapter, there are some funny one-liners here. Try the coffee. I tried the coffee. Things go a little off the rails as the true nature of the coffee here in Coffee World is revealed, and the chapter ends on essentially a remix of the ending that we saw in the final draft. I personally found this chapter to be the most disappointing of the three. A what-if scenario that pretty much gives you a Cliff Notes retelling of the events in Control, but they have been twisted to fit this new setting, just so we can see that again, Alan is coming into prominence as the master of many worlds. I mean, cool I guess? And that is to say nothing of the late game monsters that you encounter in this experience, which are just remixed versions of those weird coffee thermos mascots that we saw in the main game. I mean, I get it, it's a little fun, but it ain't great, and the mechanics surrounding these guys, again we're back in Grey Hill incident territory. I mean, there is a little charm here, and especially some of the dialogue, it keeps things from becoming too stale, and a few stylistic choices are definitely appreciated, but nah. 
this this experience was a bummer for me at least. So with two out of three campaigns landing firmly in the meh territory, that leaves Sean Ashmore, or in this case, the actor, as our last hope. And surprisingly, this is easily the best and most interesting chapter in all of the Night Springs DLC. We play as the actor who is being filmed for reference by video game director Sam. Which, I mean, Jesus, Sam Lake has found yet another way to self-insert himself into this universe. He can't keep getting away with it! He can't keep getting away with it! And obviously, this insert is the most Sam Lake that we've ever gotten. With Sam speaking in his own voice. Sean, I'm really happy. Let's talk. And playing a role which is very much in line with his everyday career path. And even the studio that he is working for, it is called Poison Pill and a cheeky nod to Remedy, complete with a retooled version of their modern logo. With the project here and the episode's title being Time Breaker, which of course is another cheeky nod, but this time the nod hits on a couple levels. But after the introductions to this unique setting, the actor walks through a retooled version of Mr. Doors' TV studio before he stumbles upon a truly bizarre scene. In his dressing room, the actor finds a dead body, and it looks exactly like, well, himself. From here, we are introduced to a red-headed woman who claims to have come from another dimension, and here is where things really start locking in connections to Remedy's previous work of Quantum Break. With the actor seeing an alternate version of himself, we are firmly in the timey-wimey multiverse stuff. The actor was playing a character from a video game, and here in this room, that character was now actually a real person from another dimension, except now he is a real dead person and suddenly the actor is thrust into a dimension jumping adventure. I'm going to leave a lot of the spoilers out for this one because I think that this is easily the most meta and most interesting part of this package. But I will say a few things. With Quantum Break still belonging to Microsoft as of this writing, Sam Lake and the team at Remedy really jumped through just about every conceivable hoop to have this tie directly into that series in everything but name. Except of course, with this being a what-if scenario as written by Alan Wake, we will see what kind of implications this has on the larger Remedy universe down the line, but for now, we are just firmly in the metafiction. But again, the narrative here does ultimately spell out connections that were already subtly established, all while completely deleting all all nuance found in the original game. However, here, with this more or less setting up a potential connection to Quantum Break for the future, there was a lot more intrigue this time around. And even though the actor doesn't quite find himself possessing Jack Joyce's time powers, at least here, Remedy's attempt at remixing mechanics from the main game fall more in line with the source material that this chapter is invoking. With the Angel Lamp from Alan Wake 2 more or less being repurposed as a time machine slash dimensional portal of sorts. And once that comes into play, things really do go off the rails in a cool way. Here more than anywhere else in Night Springs, Remedy decided to explore the ramifications of a fully connected multiverse. And while it does still manage to end up at the same Master of Many Worlds conclusion that the rest of these sections have ended on, at least here, it kind of felt earned. It's not perfect, with so much of what is here being directly lifted from the base game, and even this chapter is still lacking any tension found within the source material, still opting for a more action-focused experience even though it is still juxtaposed against a survival horror framework. But here, I don't know. I guess with the stuff that it was doing right, these mechanics just didn't bother me quite as much this time around. And then this is the one chapter in the package that gets the most experimental when it comes to tackling Remedy's trademark medium bending presentation. Again, without spoiling too much, at some point this game does try its hand at invoking some old school game mechanics, such as a side scrolling mini game that ties directly into the narrative, and then a procedural text adventure that has far more depth to it than you might expect. And then things tie directly into Quantum Break on some base level, but again, the medium is shifted directly into a comic book form, which I'd say is decently done altogether, even if I didn't quite jibe with the artwork, with some of the keyframes of some of these characters looking particularly goofy. But all told, this was the one chapter that I walked away from feeling mostly positive. And to end things on an extremely sentimental note, this whole package was played off with the help of Max Payne and director Trench himself, the late great James McCaffrey. Chasing the murder cult made me feel like I was caught in a loop. Every time I came closer, things shifted around, and I realized I was further away than ever before. But as fun as this last part was, and as touching of a moment as it was to hear one last message from the legend himself, I don't know. This whole Night Springs thing 
at the risk of sounding cliche, is just totally a mixed bag. On one hand, given the way that Sam Lake introduced this DLC chapter to the world at the Summer Games Fest, it is easy to see that this whole thing, maybe this was always meant to be nothing more than a fun diversion for the team to treat as a palate cleanser after the colossal dive into the dark and dreary world of Alan Wake 2 proper. With three familiar, fan-favorite, playable characters in mysterious, terrifying, and quirky what-if scenarios. And I can fuck with that on some level. The team definitely deserves the right to experiment and have fun with the world or uh, worlds that they've created. But the whole time that I was playing this thing, I kept getting hit with a more disquieting thought. First, we can never forget that Night Springs is only accessible at this moment to the people who paid for the deluxe edition of Alan Wake 2. If you have access to this content, you dropped an additional $20, paying not only for this outing, but the eventual second Lake House DLC as well regardless of how that one turns out. And if you are like me, you paid for this prior to knowing anything about either chapter outside of what you can infer from their titles, with this upgrade being made available before the actual sequel even launched. Second, you always need to remember that Epic Games was the publisher on Alan Wake 2, and that at the end of the day, Remedy came to a financial agreement with this publisher before this game was ever greenlit. And then third, it is incredibly important that we don't forget that as of April 30th, and possibly even the time that this video comes out, that Alan Wake 2, while it was both a critical success and loved by more than a million players, including myself to be sure, this game has yet to actually recoup the money that was budgeted towards its development and marketing. And with that third point firmly in mind, I couldn't help but wonder, is this Night Springs DLC in its current state? Is this what Remedy had intended to deliver all along, or are all the recycled assets, remixing of themes and concepts, was all of this a slapped together project that had to drastically change scope after Alan Wake 2 kind of bombs on a commercial level? Was this originally supposed to match something like the scope of American Nightmare with new assets and a story that expanded upon the established story? And did we just get robbed of something much cooler this time around? But with the deluxe edition already being sold to many people, and Remedy already being on the hook to develop not only Night Springs but also the Lake House, was this just the most that they could do with resources that didn't quite live up to what was projected, or was this what they had in mind the whole time? At this point, I can't tell you definitively, as reporting is non-existent as of right now, and only time will tell. But I couldn't shake these thoughts the entire time I was playing it. All I know is that when I look back on how Control's AWE DLC remained true to the game that it was expanding upon, but also flawlessly incorporated Alan Wake on a writing and mechanical level, I couldn't help but wonder what the fuck happened here in Night Springs. But with all that said, I've always been and will remain a fan of Remedy, and I will always continue to bet on Sam Lake. And personally, I cannot wait to see what happens with the Lake House and there really isn't a game that I'm anticipating more than Control 2. It just so happens that I was kind of disappointed this time around, but it's okay. They can't all be winners. If you made it to the end of this video, thank you for watching. I know that this is easily one of the most negative videos that I've released on this channel, and when I consider that this is for an entry in one of my favorite franchises of all time, eh, I don't know, man. Feels weird. But how about you? Did you like Night Springs? And if you did, feel free to explain why in the comments. Obviously, these are all just the opinions of one idiot on the internet, so feel free to tell me how I got this one wrong. But that said, I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, please consider subscribing to the channel in order to catch the next upload. I hope to see you in the next one, and until then, you are all beautiful people, and I hope you have a great day.